Hi, this is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho. Today we're going to talk about range animal nutrition. One of the important aspects of rangeland management is the care of animals that, that use the land, whether they be livestock or wildlife. Uh, we, as the ran managers, are um, destined to help these animals make a living out there on the range. So in order to do that, we have to understand the basics of animal nutrition. Okay, let's think about this. What do animals need nutrients and energy to do out there on the range? Once we can understand what sorts of things they have to use energy and nutrition for, then we can start to think about management opportunities. So think for just a second about what animals need energy and nutrients for. Okay, there's just a few. If you start to categorize them, they include maintenance, growth, lactation, reproduction, activity, and then uh, environmental conditions can influence how much energy or nutrients they need. We're going to go through each of these individually. So let's start with maintenance. Okay, maintenance is just that very basic level of energy and nutrients an animal needs to just get up in the morning and, and survive. It includes basal metabolism, which is, you know, the pumping of blood and, and breathing and, and uh, digestion. It's just that very basic level of metabolism. Also, a bit of a movement. Animals can't survive on the range without being able to, to move around. And then finally, they need to move around so they can eat. So those very basic levels of just staying alive on the range would be what we would put under maintenance. Um, although it is just kind of a minimum that the animal needs, it is the most amount of energy that animals need through on a yearly basis. So first they have to meet this minimum maintenance requirement and then they can do other things like grow and reproduce. So although it's the minimum, it is the most amount of energy that they need on a yearly basis. One thing we know about the maintenance requirements of animals is that they uh, it varies by size and age and whether they're domestic or not. So large animals actually have fairly low basal metabolic rates as a proportion of their body size compared to small animals. So large animals like you know elephants or even cattle or uh, you know just large ruminant animals um, require less energy as a unit of body than a small animal like a mouse or a bird. Uh, so smaller animals actually have a greater need for high quality food than large animals. Age also makes a difference. Um, the amount of ener energy that animals need to just survive varies throughout their age. It starts out very high and it decreases as they get older. Here's just an example of metabolism in sheep. The amount of energy required for a lamb at birth by the, in this study was 132 kilocals per cubic meter of, of body size. At five weeks per cubic meter, it, that amount went down almost by half to 68 kilocals per cubic meter. And then years later, when the lamb was six years old, at this time uh, um, adult sheep, only required 52 kilocals per cubic meter. So as animals get older, um, if they are um, eating enough, they'll, they'll get fatter because there's a lower amount of their energy on a daily basis that it has to be contributed to maintenance. Another kind of interesting point is that uh, when animals are young, um, say under six months of age, that just that young stage, they can be permanently stunted if they're subjected to undernutrition. So it's really important to keep young animals healthy um, so that they can uh, grow to their maximum potential. Uh, this is a problem when it's a bad year, a drought year or something, especially in wildlife, we'll see a whole um, group of animals that are born that are not as um, as large as others if they're born in a bad year. Finally, let's think a little bit about domestic and native animals. Um, most wildlife species have a lower basal metabolic rate than, um, than domestic species. It's probably because we as humans selected domestic species to, to really have um, a higher level so that they could produce milk and meat and hair and wool for us. So that selection over time created a series of animals that, that have a higher basal metabolic rate than domestic animals. So that might, I'm sorry, then wild animals. That might explain why wild animals can survive in the range without winter feeding where domestic animals might suffer from that. 
Above maintenance, then, there are several other things animals require energy and nutrients for. The first is growth. This is especially important for young animals as they mature from, you know, just being born until they're maturing. They require energy to grow up. Also, growth would be important for gestating females, especially that last trimester uh, when the calf or the foal is in the animal, is, you know, um, developing. It takes 10 to 15 percent more energy above maintenance in that last trimester. And so, you know, you people will often say uh, for a, a pregnant woman, they'll say, well, you, you need to eat more because you're eating for two. Well, that's true, especially in the last trimester. There's a lot of demand on the female for that growing fetus. Uh, after the fetus is born and becomes an animal, then lactation becomes important for the female. It's the greatest requirement above maintenance for mature females. Um, it requires 25 to 40 percent more energy than maintenance. And then finally, reproduction. There's other aspects of energy required by females, uh, especially during that last trimester of production, as we talked uh, above. And then also, males require energy during breeding season um, to find females, to service them, to travel. So oftentimes what we see with males on the range, whether it be wildlife or livestock, is that uh, during breeding season, they, they can lose a lot of body condition uh, just from that travel, etc. A level of activity is also important. Um, it takes 15% more energy to for standing that compared to laying down, for example. So kind of a trend these days is to use these standing desks instead of sitting down because it takes more energy to stand and sit or lie down. So you're burning more energy, circulating you know, more blood and, and hopefully staying more healthy. Um, again, another way to look at this is that uh, it takes 40 to 46 percent more energy for range animals than animals that are just sitting, standing in a stall and they're fed. Um, this is why one of the reasons that we have feedlots when we've got animals that you know and we're trying to bring them to um, to a, a slaughter weight, uh, we don't really want them running around on the range and um, burning up a lot of calories. So it's easier to to feed animals when they're confined, but they also spend less energy. So more of that energy goes to um, to, to meat and and fat. Um, so the, although that there is advantages to having range-fed animals, um, they do require more energy. And then finally, there's something that's completely out of our control, and that's environmental conditions. It takes more energy in cold environments to maintain themselves that body heat, and then in hot environments, it requires energy to circulate water and perspire and stay cool. Okay, so knowing those few basic principles about animals, in this case range animals, think about it and apply it to yourself. This is kind of a little activity in the middle of this uh, of this lecture. Based on those principles, what activities or conditions could create an energy demand in you that you might lose weight? Humans are always trying to lose weight. It's a multi-million dollar industry in this country. So think about what you know. How could you suggest to somebody or yourself to lose weight? Okay, it's really not that hard. There's a few things you can do. Um, okay, this first one's not very um, feasible, but um, lactating females do lose weight. So um, just, it could explain why new mothers often lose weight. It's probably not a weight loss plan. <laughs> Okay, secondly, um, exercise. Man, when people are trying to lose weight, they're always exercising and trying to, you know, use, burn up some calories. Uh, but even just doing simple things like standing instead of sitting, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, running, walking, swimming, anything you can do to use energy during the day will be a source of trying to lose some of those calories. Finally, this is one uh, that we don't usually think about, but um, keeping your house a little colder, your apartment a little colder will require you to, you know, use some more energy to keep yourself warm. And that's energy that otherwise might go to fat or weight gain. Um, so those are just some simple things. Think about now the next time you hear some great weight loss plan, if it has anything to do with those principles of how animals actually gain or lose weight in the environment. Now let's think about nutrient and energy requirements on a yearly basis. Um, if you look at in the spring, let's say the animals that are born in the spring, if you look in that springtime, uh, you'll 
see that uh, what's happening then is animals in maintenance and as that fetus grows in the female, um, especially towards that last trimester, we're gonna see a bump in energy and nutrient requirements. And when that calf or lamb or foal um, is born, then we see a, a big uh, increase in um, energy for uh, the young and for lactation. So at that time, later in the summer, when we've got birth and lactation, we see just increasing energy throughout that period. And then late in the summer, when uh, the, ano the young becomes more independent and they are weaned, then we see a radical decrease in the amount of uh, energy needed by the female. And that's because of weaning. It's because now that demand for lactation is decreased. And then uh, throughout the fall, we might see a little increase of energy as uh, the fetus starts to grow inside the body. Uh, but basically all we're having throughout that winter and that period is just maintenance. So we go from maintenance to increase uh, needs for the young and then to weaning. Okay, let's compare that with the supply of forage. Let's go back to thinking about um, what characteristics make a plant nutritious and available. I'll just think mostly about grasses and forbs here. In the spring, there's no growing stems above the ground, so there's really nothing to supply nutrients and energy for animals. Really rapidly in the spring, once it starts to green up, we start to have soluble nutrients and we start to have carbohydrates and that growth um, throughout the spring and summer as it increases and increases provides more and more supply of nutrients for rangeland animals. Uh, right about the time in the midsummer when the plants flower, then they might start to, um, to die. They'll start to die back to become dormant. And by the time we get to winter, it's all brown again. And the forage supply is pretty low uh, just because it's not that nutritious. There's some energy in it, but it gets back down to a baseline level. So the key for us as range managers is somehow to meet this supply, to use the supply to meet some demand for animals. So let's overlay those two graphs. The animal de demand is going up throughout the year and there's a peak in demand right about weaning time. And if you do it right, that peak of demand will be about at the same time as the forage supply demands. So if you take a look at this graph, there's two times that we really have to worry about meeting uh, the demands of animals on range. And that of course is in the winter, early spring, late winter. That's when the supply of forage nutrients is low. And although it is also the lowest time for nutrients for animals, that's often above what's available in the environment. So how do we meet that demand when the environment is not providing much through forage? Well, there's a few things we can do. First is to uh, make sure that that demand that right after birth and through lactation meets the supply. So the greatest energy demand should coincide with the greatest nutrient supply. So that's why um, it's, it's good to have animals born in the spring at the time when there's greatest forage quality. Of course, this is what native animals do naturally through natural selection. You know, uh, fawns and, and calves of elk are born in the spring because that's a time when nutrients become available. Uh, many range managers uh, also try to follow the pattern set by native animals to try to match that supply and demand. Uh, one of the most uh, common things we do to help animals meet that is a, a practice that's called uh, seasonal suitability or follow the green type of practice. It's when we move animals in elevation as the season progresses. Uh, so we start out in winter range down in the south where there's uh, lots of shrubs, etc., that can meet demand and then we go to spring fall range and then way up into the mountains where it's still green, even the middle of the summer. So to watch a little bit more about how this works on a sheep operation in Idaho, follow this uh, YouTube video and take a look at how these sheep move from way Southern Idaho up to above McCall. Some other ways of, of kind of meeting that demand and supply is one to think about uh, the type of operation you have. Um, cows and calves require nutrients all year round and they have that big peak uh, right in the summer. Steers might be another way to handle that instead of dealing with the winter at all, just bring steers or stalker animals onto the range uh, for that green period and then sell them, uh, take them to feedlot or take them to another range where they can survive uh, 
the you know that de deficit of nutrients and don't have to survive the winter on the range. Another way to help with the timing is to think about the forages that you plant. Uh, there are many forages that do um, hold nutrients better into the winter, like palatable shrubs or or some types of grasses. So think about the forages that you have available. Um, another idea is to just think about your stocking rate. We'll talk about stocking rates in the future, but if you set the number of animals on the range well below the supply, that's a pretty easy way to help animals meet the demand because the more forage animals, to, the more forage that animals have to choose from, the more that each one of them can meet their nutrient demands because they can just eat the best that's out there. And they also spend less time running around and trying to find forage. So they have less time to actually select their nutrients and they have higher diet quality. Let's think about some ways that we can manage the plants to help meet that demand for animals. We talked about the type of vegetation, but here's some specific ways that you could manipulate vegetation to meet animal needs. The first would be to really look carefully and maybe plant some introduced pastures. Or some plants like crested wheatgrass, they, they green up earlier than in the spring often than the native plants. So they might provide a source either early in the spring or late in the fall. There's other grasses that will be really nutritious way late into the fall. So looking into what plants you have available. Second might be to either plant or really manage for palatable shrubs on the range. Uh, remember that shrubs are have live stems in the winter, which means that they have nutrients available to animals in the winter. So if you match those nutrients from shrubs with the energy that's in the standing grass, that can also be that can be a great way to help animals meet their demand. Finally, just managing for plant diversity and having a variety of types and and groups of animal or uh, plants on the range helps animal meet animals meet their demand because there's a lot of nutrients, a variety of nutrients. So plant diversity can be important. Um, if you can't meet the demands on the range, then uh, we often, um, as managers, have to supplement animals to meet those demands. Hay can be used. It's really it's an expensive part of keeping an operation, but hay is often used. Uh, especially in really snowy uh, parts of the country. Uh, grain and energy supplements can use, if you've got standing grass, um, oftentimes uh, just a little bit of boost of energy can allow them to use that standing grass. Oftentimes what's the problem on range is low protein, so adding liquid protein or non-protein nitrogen in like molasses licks that are often including protein uh, can help animals meet demand. Now, I focus on protein because it usually is what's missing in the winter, for animals, and it's really important to make sure that the forage is supplying more than 6% protein. And the reason that is important is because uh, about 6% protein in the diet is what the rumen microbes need to survive. And if you don't have effective and healthy rumen microbes, then you can't digest any of the energy that's out there and available. So that's kind of the break point. Uh, and it does happen often that that standing grass on range falls below 6% protein. And it's a time when we need to think about providing protein on the range. So how do wildlife cope with this season of low quality? Uh, they don't always have someone out there to supplement for them, so they've got ways to survive in the winter. Uh, the first thing is they're, uh, they spend a lot of um, energy late in the fall to build up those fats and really select high quality diets. So animals can survive for a long time just on that built up fat in their bodies. Um, said that some of the studies that I've looked at is uh, grazing animals with good fat reserves can survive a month or two, 30 to 60 days with little or no forage or food consumption. And uh, there was even a study uh, where they were looking at uh, mule deer that had uh, pretty high levels of fat and then were able to survive um, over two months with of complete starvation with no food at all, just water. So, uh, um, I, you know, I don't think we want to push animals that hard, but they, if they have good fat, they can survive quite a while without food. Um, so fat supplies are also important because uh, several vitamins like vitamin A are stored in the fat. So they're, those fat-soluble vitamins uh, become available as the fat is burned. Uh, remember we talked about native animals having basically lower metabolic rates than domestic animals. They also have an ability to to lower their metabolic rate in the winter and go into sort of a standing estus where they are um, kind of hibernating but still going. So they're actually lowering their basal metabolic rate. They're still active, 
but they have this ability to adjust bit metabolic rates. Domestic animals do not have a, a great extent uh, to, to, to be able to adjust their metabolic rate, but many native animals do. Uh, nutrient recycling also, qu quite a few native ruminants uh, like bison, for example, um, are really efficient at recycling nitrogen in their system. So uh, a lot of nitrogen comes out in the urine, but in the case of uh, like bison, they have an ability to to harvest that um, ammonia in their um, in you know in their digestive system and then um, cycle it back through saliva so that it comes back into the dig digestive system. So it's not lost in the urine. Urine. And then finally, wild wild animals um, are pretty canny at finding nutrients and especially minerals in the environment, and they often will eat soil, soil ingestion. And um, as you go across the range, you'll often see on the map or you'll see a sign that says, you know, this is to Williams Lick or some something Lick. Well, those Lick areas are areas where wildlife historically went to um, harvest uh, minerals and they actually licked soil. So they have some abilities that most livestock aren't capable of handling. So those are some of the basic principles, things to think about as you're caring for animals on the range, whether they be wild or domestic.